Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this afternoon's webinar. Um, I'd like to present the National League of Transgender Network, and our current um, kind of change the title of the slide or the title of the webinar. But it's called Unveiling the Pertinent HIV Prevention Messages for Native Transgender Women with Cultural Teachings and Comprehensive Health Care. Um, I am Michaela Gray, and currently working with the National Native American AIDS Prevention Center. And unfortunately, our co-presenter Renee Swoop will not be able to join us this afternoon. But we're more than she did contribute to these slides. So let's continue. In brief, I think I'm only preaching to the choir with this slide, but let me just state this: transgender people are often overlooked and misrepresented when talking about healthcare. Transgender health is a complicated series of steps and is new territory for most healthcare providers. In order to provide comprehensive healthcare, transgender people must have access to mental, behavioral health, and I think we also wanted to add in their HIV prevention services, HIV treatment services, uh, physical exams, so on and so forth, also access to hormone therapy. So I currently work with the National Native American AIDS Prevention Center, and this is our current mission. And just like every other nonprofit that's out there, our mission is constantly evolving and constantly changing. So the mission is as follows, to eliminate HIV AIDS and confront related health and social determinants that negatively impact American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, and Indigenous peoples. So, this can include HIV prevention, but it can also transfer itself to um, hep, C, hep C awareness, hep C prevention, hep C treatment services. So we're constantly making this evolve, and we're rolling with the changes as they come along to us. So nonetheless, please look to see how our um, mission is currently changing. The mission of the National Native Transgender Network is as follows, to empower the American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian transgender communities through HIV prevention, health and safety promotion, and active engagement of communities in Indian country and beyond. So this is definitely trying to get, give voice or give a platform to Native transgender people, whether they're identifying as trans women, trans men, trans person, but somebody who is wanting to be active in the community and give the transgender voice relevance in these discussions surrounding HIV prevention, care and treatment, regular health care, prevention and treatment services, and other issues as well, too. And the picture that you see is a very comical picture of myself and Renee that we are attending the, in this picture we're attending the Public Health Summit or the actually the uh, Philadelphia Trans Health Summit earlier last summer, so definitely having fun and give us gives you a little bit of an idea of what kind of personas are in our in our network. The origins of the <clears throat> network are as follows. Uh, the network started was formed in December of twenty thirteen by a group of native trans women and was advertised at the twenty thirteen US Conference on AIDS. But prior to all of this there were probably many formal and informal discussions regarding a better formulation of trans persons in order to be able to give that voice a platform within Indian country. So some of the reasons why the NNTN was formed mm -hmm. is as follows. Transgender people are often excluded from important health policy discussions. Also, trans people are often invisible in Native communities across the country. Transgender people are stigmatized in most Native communities. Gay men and or two-spirit individuals were asked to speak in place of a transgender person at conferences, at healthcare discussions, at education sessions. So we found that definitely very disturbing. And finally, transgender women and men are of substantial risk for HIV, violence, suicide, substance abuse, and alcohol abuse. So in order to give voice, give a platform, give, make the transgender voice relevant within Native communities, these are some of the reasons why we formulated the network. 
So we started out <clears throat> with a couple things to focus on, one of which was mentorship, membership, community engagement, and education. And you can see the series of steps that we took in order to arrive at these various foundations. We sent out invitations for folks to join us. We did our first conference call and to discuss and kind of lay, give the layout of what was going to happen <clears throat> for Native people, Native transgender people who are joining this network. We scheduled and held our first face-to-face -face meeting <clears throat> and kind of nailed down exactly what our mission and vision was going to be. And from here forward, we're actually going to start assembling a toolkit. We're going to put in their presentations, Native Transgender 101 discussions, um, how to work more effectively with your Native transgender person or persons living in your community, how to be more sensitive to that population. So we're slowly pulling these things together. We're also adding in um, HIV prevention tools and prevention messages as well too. So constantly look at our website or actually our Facebook page in order to access some of those materials. The membership criteria of Indian Indian is as follows, to be American Indian, Alaska Native, or Native Hawaiian. Of course, to be an open transgender individual. To be committed to, be, to actively participate in the process. And to be respectful in engaging other trans individuals on the community as well, but also actively and respectfully engaging folks in the community, whether it was at an um, education session, whether it was a tribal leader discussion, whether they were formal or, or informal types of speaking engagements, we wanted those individuals to be very respectful in those regards. Here are some of the core members that we have, and this was taken at a Circle of Harmony conference. <clears throat> and all of us in this picture are transgender people, transgender women namely, and we all come from various communities on Navajo Nation. But we wanted to expand from Navajo Nation to other communities as well too. So we welcome other Native trans individuals to join our group as well too. But if we come to our, your community to do presentations, we will look like this, very you know, professionally dressed, very put together and you know most most likely smiling. Our core membership, <clears throat> our current members include the following individuals, and it's only growing month by month. We have Maddie, myself, Renee, Trudy, Nazba, Riva, Lala, and Stella. So we're only looking to grow from this particular foundation as well. Our funding comes from two primary sources of funding, the Transgender Justice Fund, as well as from the cooperative agreement that NAPSI possesses with <clears throat> the National Indian Health Board. And our opportunities to look for additional funding is only is at, is the potential is out there. So we're looking for more funding opportunities as well. So <clears throat> some of the fundamental discussions that we have with community members, with healthcare providers with tribal leaders are as follows. We talk about the trans umbrella. And some of you may or may not be familiar with this term, <clears throat> but the trans umbrella refers to an all, all-encompassing type of description for people who cross-dress, people who identify as trans women, trans men, trans person, people who cross-dress. <clears throat> so we're kind of put under this huge umbrella for, you know, Western society. But, you know, when it comes to Native discussions and Native-centered, Native-focused types of discussions regarding the trans individual, those conversations are a bit different. And so when we go out to Native communities and we go and bring up these discussions, we do have different topics that come up. We do have different ways, and we are open to different ways of being able to to be able to, to describe each other, to describe this, this particular population. So we're very much open to this, but we do have these discussions and we talk about the Western and non-Western non sense of all of this. We also share this definition of transgender. <clears throat> One of the definitions is literally across gender, sometimes in, interpreted as beyond gender. And when I was talking about this earlier with another person, I definitely think that for Native communities, 
we definitely surpass this definition of the Western sense of gender. We definitely think about the number of people with roles as community in a, as community members, but we also think about excuse me. We also think about it as people who surpass that whole definition and oscillate between two continuums of being man and woman. And then sometimes as you as you begin life you may become you may be more male, for example. But then <clears throat> towards the middle part, maybe even latter stages of your life cycle, that person becomes more and more female. So it's definitely a continuum. It definitely um, gives gender fluidity, more more leeway in Native communities, but not always. But these are some of the ways that we talk about the transgender person. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm having a little bit of <clears throat> issues with speaking clearly here. So, so we, we want to talk, also talk about the epidemiology. And one of the major focuses of this particular discussion is the fact that transgender people are at very high risk for HIV infection. This particular slide gives notice or gives, uh, makes puts special attention on transgender women. But it was, um, I think it's something that we can definitely discuss, but we can also discuss in terms of how trans men may be impacted by this as well, too. But uh, let me just begin. Transgender women are at very high risk for HIV infection. In fact, in 2010, the CDC reported that transgender population had the highest percentage of new HIV positive test results when compared to men and women in the United States. And here's a pie chart that basically displays that. It was released in a fact sheet from the CDC in April 2015, and it was entitled HIV Among Transgender People. And again, we see the larger slice of the pie here being allocated to the transgender population. According to the CDC, <clears throat> as of 2010, the newest high, the highest new HIV positive test results among transgender among the transgender population or among ethnic minorities. We see African Americans leading that category, followed by Latinos, Latinos, then American Indian, Alaska Natives being number three, and then Native Hawaiian other Pacific Islanders being fourth. So our work is cut out for us. We definitely have work to do in this population. And here's a pie chart basically showing the same thing. So although we are number three in line of everybody else ahead of us, we definitely have work to do within the Native, within the American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian population. We have to bring awareness. We have to encourage testing. We have to encourage folks to get into their health care providers, even if they think that they've been at risk, they've been exposed. <clears throat> and even even if you know, the, the tests come back reactive, there's still a way to live with HIV. There's still a way to maintain health. There's still a way to maintain hormone therapy and active transition, even while living with HIV. But also, if you don't have, if you have a non-reactive exam, at least you still have that leeway to continue practicing and preventing HIV infections with various tools. So part of the Native Transgender Network's responsibility and work is to promote that. So we also talk about reservation realities because sometimes we go to communities that are not so rural. Uh, for, in fact, you know, one of the major discussions that we had at Philadelphia was what do reservations look like? What do people, how do people live there? Is it something like the suburbs of Philadelphia? Is it, do we, is it kind of like going to your country house as opposed to and living in the city or something? What is it like? So we kind of have to paint these realities for folks living in more urban areas. <clears throat> and sometimes if you grow up in a city as a native person and don't really have ties to a reservation, you may not know. And, um, but it definitely gives, you know, again, it gives the platforms to folks who have grown up in reservation communities. So, for example, the Navajo Nation is the size of West Virginia, 27,000 square miles that encompass Arizona, New Mexico, a little bit of Colorado, and Utah. The population is 180,000 plus, and that's probably <clears throat> probably the staple. It's probably not the fault that includes folks who migrate between reservation communities and the city. Unemployment is pretty high at 44%, and 43% 
of reservation residents live below the poverty rate. <clears throat> the median income for a family is about $11,885 per year, which is pretty low. And here are some pictures of gals that have that we have some interactions with. It's on the upper, uh, your upper left-hand corner, we see three members, three core members of the transgender network doing an informal meeting in Philadelphia. And most of the people who are pictured here are transgender people. Um, of course, we see our, one of our supporters with Noah Cody <clears throat> pictured there as well, too. But we definitely have people who want to represent the fact that <clears throat> we do have a diversity of people. We do have a diversity of female um, transgender people in, their, in our midst. But we also have supporters as well, too. Some of the reservation realities of our trans women. <clears throat> For, and even trans men as well, too. Uh, greater than 20 miles to obtain health care in most instances, especially if you're living in a rural area like the Navajo Nation. Sometimes there's, actually most oftentimes, there's limited trans-specific health care services in those areas. Uh, we do, uh, in Navajo, we do have the fortunate, uh, we're very fortunate in the fact that we do have trans-specific services at some, uh, some reservation community clinics that we have. Uh, trans women oftentimes have problems finding jobs. And unfortunately, there's high substance use as well, too, for rates of discrimination and stigma. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be ostracized or ridiculed for being more fem feminine or choosing that feminine way of life while still you know, while being, of course, acknowledged by your community as being male, you're probably going to find ways to cope with that, find ways of using alcohol and other substances to help cope with some of that. And even the transition itself, the transition can be draw jarring for a lot of transgender women. Mm -hmm. The impact on mental health and behavioral health is definitely important in this discussion. And so trying to branch out primary health care services to include mental health services, behavioral health services, and substance abuse is definitely key in this. <clears throat> so again, in addition to the other reservation realities listed before, limited access to recovery services, health care, like we said before, emergency care, police protection, social services, and education. And, some, and then it's just basically reinforcing the fact that trans people, because of discrimination, because of stigma, may not feel welcomed to go to get emergency care or even health care or even to access education services because if you go to those areas, if you go to the clinic, if you go to that school, are people going to accept a, me as a woman, B, are they going to recognize my <clears throat> preferred name, and C, where am I going to live if I go to school there? Are they going to put me in the female dorm or the male dorm? And just how much more, is, how much more difficult is my life going to be once going into those and enduring those areas? Am I going to be even more inclined to go and seek more degrees of education? Can I actually focus on what I'm supposed to be doing there? So, Again, the same question for recovery services. Typically, there are the male and female specific services. But, you know, recovery services also need to include people who don't fall within that male, female, Western ideal of, <clears throat> of, that, whole, of that whole gender discussion. There needs to be a place for folks who may feel comfortable just in between. So, again, limited access to some of these services. Uh, I mentioned before that IHS facilities do offer hormone therapy within the four corners, and these are some of the service units that do so. Albuquerque, Crown Point, Gallup Indian Medical Center for New Mexico, for Arizona, the Phoenix Indian Medical Center, <clears throat> as well as Tuba Health, Tuba City Healthcare Corporation. Um, in some of these places, like for example, Phoenix Indian Medical Center as well as the Gallup Indian Medical Center, people who are at high risk for acquiring HIV can access PrEP pre-exposure prophylaxis at those two facilities. So long as you agree to go in for HIV testing routinely and also get tested, but also to be um, routinely followed with labs, doctor's visits, and take your medication as prescribed 
You are not to share them. You are to continue taking them as, as prescribed, just like hormone therapy. Also, I wanted to also note that in those two particular facilities, and I think even beyond that, HIV care is also available as well, too. <clears throat> and this is, this is just a slide of the four corners. Unfortunately, we have very limited information about PrEP as well as hormone therapy services beyond the four corners. So if folks out in, the, in Indian country listening to this webinar can provide me more information about that, I'd really appreciate it. So <clears throat> for a lot of transgender people, this is unfortunately the, the picture of health or the picture of their current state of health. Very, and you can see that all quadrants of this perfect circle that was supposed to, that's all in balance is completely out of balance here. We see the mental side not in sync with the spiritual side and so forth with the physical and emotional. Everything is disjointed and everything is impacted by something. Like for example, the mental, the mental health realm is impacted by, could be sexual trauma or just trauma in general, alcohol and substance abuse. The, the physical portion could be impacted by homelessness. If you're going to be openly transgender, does your family accept you? And if they don't, then you may be homeless. Intimate partner violence, clinic distrust. For the spiritual aspect, <clears throat> having an HIV or other types of diseases diagnosis, being disowned by your family, being ostracized by your community. The emotional realm could be impacted by the homophobia, discrimination, and shame. So we see that all these areas are being plagued by things that may be really important, or actually not important, but just really impacting transgender people who don't have an outlet or don't have this necessary support. But when that, this whole picture can transform to look like this, <clears throat> when you have specific health support services, Balance can be restored. Harmony can be restored to a person's mental, spiritual, physical, and emotional health by having traditional healer support, family support, having access to behavioral health support systems, having just being just having a clinic or an office or a space that is LGBTQ sensitive, <clears throat> having open and friendly preventative health care services. So some of these things can definitely support these to come into harmony a little bit more and a little bit quicker. So if you're in reservation areas, if you're, def if you're working in these <clears throat> various quadrants, being able to support this kind of ideal is definitely important for a transgender as well as other individuals in the community. So this, the work that the National Native Transgender Network <clears throat> is embarking on is a fourfold type of process. We're concerned about and definitely work towards mentorship. <clears throat> we are also working towards visibility, advocacy, capacity building assistance, slash technical assistance. Under, native, under the visibility portion of this, the NNTN would like to be more visible at conferences, <clears throat> tribal leadership meetings, interaction with federal and state officials, serve as a board of directors, have a positive social media presence, have a positive print media, television media, as well as radio <clears throat> presence. And in this way, we could definitely support public health discussions. We could talk about societal, um, societal issues as well as judicial issues as well, too. Advocacy, again, <clears throat> as I alluded to that before, with print media, social media, and also in the radio positively in reaffirming in, and in reaffirming ways talk about social issues, health issues, judicial issues. Um, how can we advocate for these things? How can we add our piece into <clears throat> the bathroom discussions, for example, that whole bathroom controversy? Where do you send a young transgender individual who wants to embark on that lifestyle? What bathroom do you send her to? Do you send him to? Do you send they to? Do you send Z to? And how do you use the pronouns appropriately? So we are definitely available to feed, to feed into these discussions. Um, we, are, we can involve ourselves in these, and we can definitely speak <clears throat> in a positive, re more reaffirming way on these particular topics, as well as other topics that may come up as well, too. In the <clears throat> realm of 
capacity building and technical assistance, the following topics we do discuss, transgender 101, cultural sensitivity, transgender health and wellness, and that includes all of the following topics, HIV prevention, suicide prevention, alcohol and substance abuse slash treatment, intimate partner violence, and the transgender judicial process. Sometimes people just need a little bit more information about how to meander some of those judicial um, systems. Uh, the mentorship aspect of it is we're definitely interested in this piece. We're interested in mentoring other transgender individuals because they may not have appropriate access to hormone therapy or may not even know that hormone therapy exists in their community. <clears throat> they may also not know health, uh, friendly health care providers in their community. Or on the same token, they may not have access to friendly mental health providers or appropriate access to substance abuse and or flash <clears throat> alcohol treatment as well, too. We also want to help with resume building and public speaking. So, again, fostering these things, talking through these things, uh, being available to transgender individuals at all levels, just having somebody to be able to reach out to, whether it's via Facebook or through um, email, being able to talk to somebody saying, I need a little more support in this arena. I need to find a doctor who's friendly to me. I need to find a <clears throat> mental health care provider who will not judge me but work with me. So we definitely are in the business. Not Actually, I shouldn't say business. We are definitely focused on mentorship strategies as well, too. So social media presence, <clears throat> we have a Facebook page, the National Native Transgender Network, or the NNTN. You can see the following link below, so please click on that to find us. And let me see here, what else do we have? Yeah, but beyond that, I'd like to thank you very much for being a part of this webinar. I know it was very, uh, very comprehensive and probably a lot of topics to present. But I also wanted to shed some light on the fact that we do have a brochure that's going to be published very soon and displayed on our Facebook page. Let me go back to that slide. <clears throat> on the Facebook page there, as well as a video PSA talking about HIV prevention. And I think the name, the theme of that is My Body, My Status, My Choice. That's going to be the theme for this next uh, round of HIV prevention messaging for the National Native Transgender Network. So thank you very much for your time. If you have any other questions, please reach out to me via Facebook, but also you can email me here as well. Uh, thank you again for your time, and I hope to chat with you all soon. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>